Hello and welcome to As I See It, A Blind Woman's View. My name is Andrea Judici and I am the producer and I have with me my guide dog who, as always, I'm not introducing for the safety of us as a team and for him never to get distracted if someone uses his name. I'm so excited because we're here again talking about this series that I came up with and I'm so much fun talking about. It's Pup and Person to Partners. So, so far we've learned about what a puppy does to get ready to be a guide dog and we've learned about what a person does from a mobility perspective to get ready to be partnered with a guide dog. But there are a lot of other steps that have to happen before a team is created. And one of those, and possibly the most crucial of those, is the training of that adorable puppy that you saw here and the puppy that was about to go into training that you saw here, going to the program where they've been bred and, and raised for to learn how to be a guide dog. And I have always said that the reason that I love to do my show is because I have something I'm interested in and then I bring in an expert to make me look like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so today I have with me Jamie Madison and she's an apprentice instructor at Guide Dogs for the Blind, which is a guide dog school based in California with also a campus in Oregon. And it is where my guide dog and I graduated from. And I'm going to be talking to Jamie today about what happened with my dog and all the other dogs that start as puppies are born at the California campus, go out to puppy raisers all over the, wet, the Western United States, and then come back. And then months later are ready to be partnered with a blind person. It's, it's just amazing. So Jamie, thank you for coming all the way from California to do this inter or Oregon to do this interview. <laughs> That's so cool. You, you, you get a gold star for being the guest who's traveled the oh, farthest. Thanks for having to me, be Andrea. on my show. <laughs> um, let me start by asking, how did you, how did you find yourself in um, the field of guide dog training? What was your path? So every trainer has a different story of how they discovered they wanted to train guide dogs. Um, I grew up in a the small town of New Richmond, Wisconsin. So I had more of a discovery path <laughs> than maybe some other trainers did. Um, I knew that I wanted to make some impact on the world and I thought that meant that I needed to be a medical professional. So I went to school as a, a pre-med student. I switched partway through to uh, be a pre-veterinary student because I knew I loved animals. Um, and I graduated from Amherst College ultimately with a biology degree. From there, I realized that what I was learning, it wasn't quite enough for me. Uh, I knew that both of those career paths were very admirable and you could do many good things with it, but it wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do with my life. So I started looking for more internships to do with animals and in my searches, I discovered this school in California Moore Park College, where they have an exotic animal training and management program. I took a tour there. It was so fun. Oh, it's amazing. I, I could go on and on about that school. Um, so in their information, they talk about the different career paths that people with this degree go on to do. And to my surprise, one of them is working with service animals. And I had this big light bulb go on when I read that. I realized service animals, of course, you know, I was looking for that, that connection between the love of animals and wanting to make an impact in people's lives. And service animals was absolutely that industry that does that. So I packed up and moved to California <laughs> um, and completed my exotic animal training and management degree at Moore Park College, where we got to tour the Guide Dogs for the Blind facility in San Rafael uh, in, a, in my second year. and. All it took was one tour for me to know that that's where I wanted to work. Um, they have an amazing mission and provide this unparalleled service to our clients that are the reason for, for what we do. So the rest is history from there. Awesome. I um, got hired on at the Oregon campus and I've been working with guide dogs ever since. Cool. So <laughs> your job is to take these puppies who we talked with a puppy raiser earlier in the series mm -hmm. who have learned how to be a good citizen at home, how to be a good citizen in public, have become accustomed to the world um, that is most similar to the world to be working in as a professional once they've got their training. Mm -hmm. So what happens when they come into the campus and are ready for training? What is the process that you're going to go through with them? Mm -hmm. So they come into campus with this wonderful foundation obedience and socialization 
that makes it possible for me to do my job. I cannot speak highly enough of the puppy raisers and how crucial they are <laughs> for me to be able to be a trainer and focus on teaching the dog guide work rather than um, for it not to chew up toys in the house. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they arrive on campus um, either in, for guide dogs to the blind, either in California or in Oregon, and they get assigned to an instructor. So uh, for us, we get assigned four dogs for, for a training string, and that's who I will work with for the next three months. We start with some basic foundational skills. So for a guide dog, uh, we have to teach them to move with the leash and move with their collar. So everyone's probably seen that pet dog that maybe bulks when they're, they get collar pressure. We teach our dogs that you can move with that collar pressure and then we can direct them as we're teaching them how to move down the street. So that's a basic foundational skill. Um, from there, we end up taking them off of campus and they get an introduction to their first town environment. Um, their first town is typically you know, maybe a quieter, not exactly rural, but a quieter town, so they can really focus on learning guide work basics, uh, which, Andrew, is f you're familiar with, left, yep. how to go right, yep. how to go forward. So all of these directions that the handler is going to cue, we teach them what that means. Um, they learn all of their uh, basics of crossing streets safely, um, how to move around obstacles on their line, and all of this in a more basic kind of environment. From there, so around, um, around four weeks or so, we have a preliminary testing at Guide Dogs for the Blind where they get checked in on just their basic guide work mechanics, how they're doing in that more basic environment. Um, and from they pass, if they pass that testing, then they move on to the next part of their guide dog training. Uh, for us, we move to an environment that has more traffic, um, it has pedestrians, so we're adding more complexities to their environment, and that might mean traveling to the Portland area if um, the dog is being trained in Oregon, or possibly onto like San Francisco in mm -hmm. California. Yep. So from there, we're really teaching them the, the intricacies of guide work and keeping their person really safe. So. Pedestrian work is one of the most challenging things that a, a yes, guide dog has to learn. Is. It is, and it takes a while. <laughs> um, and we have volunteers that help us with pedestrian training because people like to just part like the sea when a guide dog <laughs> walks um, down the sidewalk. So having to keep a person safe by their side while a person is moving around, and maybe there's even a crowd, that's what we could, would consider advanced work mm -hmm. for them. Yep. Um, they also learn more complex, maybe curbs. So everyone has a different home environment and you go to a complex city environment and maybe there are way more obstacles in the way if you're making a left turn. So they're learning how to navigate all of those complexities of the environment as well. We also add in building work. So that's not something we do right away. Um, so working in, in a building and finding maybe something like an elevator or an escalator, uh, more stairs than they would have had previously as well. So all of those different, we call them targets, target points, um, things they would find for their handler. Mm -hmm. um, we would be working on that in those later stages as and well. And so it's so true because when you talked about the foundation that the puppy mm -hmm. raisers, when, so for the puppy raisers, they're getting the dogs accustomed to being on the street as a yep. dog, just as, yep. a, just as a dog, just being comfortable in the environment of mm -hmm. people and sounds. The dog has probably gone to a mall, to a restaurant, to the grocery store, mm -hmm. but they've only gone just to experience it. They had no responsibility other than to behave themselves. Right. So that is the foundation that you're building this amazing structure of mm -hmm. how to do guide work on, mm -hmm. which is so cool. It just, it just, it's so awesome. Yeah. You hit on the head too that, that um, later environment that we put them in all of a sudden has those different noises, um, the sound of people talking, maybe there's a train around, maybe there are buses. So in that quieter environment, they don't have those factors. We really want them to focus on learning just how to be a very straightforward guide dog. Their default settings, Yes, <laughs> we yep, like to go. say. And then when they learn more complex things, we're also adding in 
distractions, right? Whether it's noise, mm -hmm. um, maybe there weren't many, as many dogs in that basic environment. Maybe now there are a lot of dogs walking in downtown Portland um, with their owners and birds, things like that. So we're right. adding in this yep. extra level um, of really reality um, to get them to the point where they are when they come to you. Awesome. Yeah. You talked about training dogs to cross streets, and I know that as a guide dog user, handler, mm -hmm. I get asked a lot, and I want to make, I want to have, I want to have, I want to clear the record up right now. <laughs> I thought I know what you're going to ask. I know you, I know, <laughs> I know you do. So when you train a guide dog to cross a street, mm -hmm. you aren't actually teaching them to determine when correct. to read the light, to look at the light and know mm -hmm. when the color is red and green, correct? That is absolutely correct. Yay, so. I've been vindicated. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, our dogs do not know when it is safe to cross. They know the mechanics of what to do in the crossing when the handler tells them that it is okay. So it is uh, the handler's responsibility to make sure that their dog and them are safe when they're about to do that, that crossing. And you're the expert on the different ways that you're able to determine <laughs> yes. that. Yeah. But there is something fascinating and one of the things that I find so amazing, well, everything about a trained guide dog is amazing, but. Mm -hmm. Um, something that comes into play in my life on a regular basis is the intelligent disobedience that my dog has oh, been yes. taught, the confidence that has been instilled in my dog, in any guide dog, that yes, my job is to do what I'm told, except mm -hmm. when it's not safe. Great, so that intelligent disobedience is, we start teaching that about halfway through. So again, you think about teaching a dog the basics, well, it's more advanced for them to refuse a command. Right, so we're teaching them at first that when the handler gives a command, there's no reason that you should not listen to, listen to it. Um, and then we start making the world more complex and we introduce that maybe sometimes when the dog receives a command, there's a reason that they can't obey that command. So we, we're talking about crossings. If there's a car, you know, sometimes they're trying to look to the right and see if they can or to the left to make their turn, they've actually pulled into the crosswalk. Mm -hmm. So for the dog, if they were to make that crossing, once you gave the command, they'd have to actually maybe even go into traffic to right. try. Yep. That's not safe, right? Yes. So they learn that if their pathway is completely blocked, then they're, it's not safe for them to obey that, that command. It's mm -hmm. just the most astounding thing to me because most of us who've had pet dogs, we know that if our dog is good, it does what we say. And mm -hmm. yet a guide dog has the confidence to know, well, you know, every now and then you are absolutely not right uh -huh. because my eyes are seeing what you are not and mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it. And I just think it's just phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, just I, I totally agree. You know, the, the training of guide dogs um, is really unique in the service animal industry. We're not necessarily just teaching a set of, of behaviors we're really teaching them how to think <laughs> yep. um, and teaching them, you know, a, a form of intelligence and decision making that is, is really, it's quite unique and it's quite amazing. I agree. And, you know, the trust that it takes for a handler to think to themselves, oh, my dog's refusing the command oh, well, maybe there's something there. Like, that takes a lot of trust, right? It does. And we all <laughs> to hear trust in your the dog. back of our head, we hear our instructor going, trust your dog, yeah. follow your dog, trust your dog, <laughs> who can see? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and every now and then, I will admit that I override, and mm -hmm. thankfully, anytime I've done that, the, the reason that my dog has not been going forward is something that is not harmful or mm -hmm. um, fatal to me. Right. It's a huge puddle. Right. Or it's, you know, it, and I've just, and, and it reminds me, I'm supposed to listen to my dog. I'm supposed <laughs> to follow my dog. So here's a question I have for you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know from my experience that all of the people who train the guide dogs are sighted. So how do I know when I get my guide dog that you, that his instructor, not, no, not you, of course, <laughs> his instructor has somehow not... <laughs> inadvertently there's so dogs pick up on such subtle subtle oh, yeah. communication mm -hmm. how do we know as graduates and and handlers that our dog hasn't been somehow cued by the person working it who could see mm -hmm. to avoid certain things oh, that's such a good question so well one we as an, as trainers are spending years learning how to not do exactly, <laughs> exactly what you were that, describing right. um and then two our dogs are are tested when we can't we can't see. So we're wearing a sleep shade during um, all of that that testing. So if you happen to be doing something while you were sighted, 
that you didn't notice or didn't realize, well, all of a sudden your, your dog isn't doing what it's asked to do, right? So by having all of our testing done under a, a, with the instructor under a blindfold, we're really making sure that no matter what the instructor is doing, the dog has yep. learned um, all of that. And I can say it's definitely an art to learn to, to do what you do. <laughs> and I wasn't very good at it at first, and I'm still And that's why there's an apprenticeship learning. program, because it's not, mm -hmm. you can't just, um, show up at guide dogs one day and say, okay, I'm ready to train a, a dog to be someone's eyes. And they're like, great, here's a dog. And in three months, you can give it to a blind person. Exactly. Have at it. <laughs> and good um, luck to you. <laughs> you know, most of our, our trainers now at this point have four-year degrees and some further education. I have two degrees at this point. Um, some even come in with master's degrees in potentially orientation mobility or um, psychology, something like that. So, and then we also end up having some sort of animal training experience as well. So we come in with a diverse array of talents that they mold into a guide dog trainer over the course of the three-year apprenticeship. Um, and when we come in, we tend to initially focus more on the dog training aspect. And then we move on to learning more about the client training because that's, that's its own set of skills, right? Um, and then from there, we end up going through a variety of testing at Guide Dogs for the Blind, including um, planning and executing a route that you do under blindfold with no other assistance but you and your dog, um, as well as presenting a portfolio that involves all of these different scenarios that we encounter throughout our apprenticeship with dog training challenges, um, client training problem solving, and field work problem solving as well. I would imagine that whatever dog it is that you work at that final testing when you're going to pass your apprenticeship is a dog you have a pretty special bond with, I would think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, we, you, you pick your date for your test and you have your four dogs that you've trained to choose from. And I've, uh, next year will be when I undertake that myself. And I, when I've watched other apprentices choose, you know, they're really, they're really thinking hard about what's, speed they want to walk because guide dogs walk different paces yep. right you know i'm probably not gonna be comfortable going with a fast dog <laughs> um, as well as the particular skill set of that dog and the environment that they've planned their route so all of our dogs are they're able to do a, a city environment but just like people they have their own areas that they thrive in where they really shine and so some dogs may be better in that environment where they're planning their route than other dogs would be that makes sense. And mm -hmm. something that's also really interesting to me about guide dog training. So here you are, you've got this dog and we all, you know, some people in the world might think that dogs are really cute and fun, but mm -hmm. not particularly uh, cap capable of advanced uh, higher level thinking. Mm -hmm. you've, you're teaching it to see for someone. You're teaching it to understand a huge array of words that most mm -hmm. dogs don't ever have to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and to know it's right from its left with many humans, myself included, are not good at. <laughs> Um, and, but so then also that that's one of your skills, but, and then you also need to be able to teach a person how to work with that dog. Mm -hmm. But then there's this other thing, which is the matching. Mm -hmm. So it's not a situation where Andrea applies for a dog and they go, okay, it's uh, August 1st and Andrea's coming into class and this is the dog that's ready. So we're right. just going to put her with that dog because that's how this works. This is the August 1st dog and that's the August 1st mm -hmm. person. There's an incredible amount of forethought and, and, and intuition and experience that goes into matching a person and a dog. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're really having to have, it's, you, you have to be able to excel at, a, at, at, like I said, the dog training piece of it, the, the tr p training a person piece yeah. of it, and also sort of the understanding of both dog and human personalities to make a match because I'm going to spend, as a guide dog handler, I'm gonna spend more time mm -hmm. with this dog than I do with any other living creature in my entire world. Absolutely. <laughs> and so if he and I are completely, I always say to people, it can be as simple as he's a morning person and I'm not. Mm -hmm. um, that can really throw the relationship. It's not that he can't do the, the work, but if he had something that just was his, he was absolutely mm -hmm. determined that was something that was important to him. And I'm like, that so isn't my thing. Mm -hmm. It could really cause a bonding problem. Yeah. Um, and I, and we couldn't get to the point where I could he could demonstrate the fact that he was a really good dog because I'm like, right. I can't stand the fact that you're up at five in the morning every morning and you want to play and you want to work and by six o'clock at night, you're dead. And I'm a jazz musician. <laughs> I start my night at 5 a.m., you know, whatever. Yeah. So 
<laughs> I think that that's so interesting because I think I, I know from what I've heard from people I talk to that they think that a guide dog trainer is is just a trainer of dogs. Mm -hmm. And it's so much more than that because you're a trainer of dogs, you're a trainer of people. Mm -hmm. And you also really have to understand that you're not just training a dog to have behavior. You're training a dog to be someone's eyes. And that's such a enormous responsibility. And it's so cool that guide dogs you have the apprenticeship so that any of us who graduate from this program absolutely know these instructors have had huge amounts of education just to make them a well-rounded person, but also specific to the, the skill they have here at this school doing this job. Yeah, there's no degree in guide dog training. No, there's really not. <laughs> nope. Uh, and I think, you know, you have, this, you have this wonderful ability to make amazing observations um, about, so we, like you said, you know, a, you are spending so much time with your guide dog. So this dog could have the most wonderful guide work mechanics, but how many hours out of the day is it guiding you versus being a dog in your home or at yep. your desk, or yep. at, you exactly. know, at your, work, your workplace? And so we really listen to people when they say their preferences. Oh, you want an affectionate dog, a snuggly dog. You want a dog that will be more friendly with people, a dog that maybe will just ignore kids or something, maybe, you know, if you're a teacher. Um, and so we really look at, you know, their house behavior, the areas that they excelled at with obedience and socialization um, to really try and make that match, not just in their guide work, but in the livability of exactly. being that's, with that and, dog. And, and you bring up a great point, which is so many people, when they see me out in, in the world with my dog, and of course, anyone unless they know me personally and are a personal friend, they never see my dog except when he's working. Mm -hmm. So they assume he works all the time. Right. And I have to remind them that in my house, he doesn't work because I know my way around. And if mm -hmm. I'm in a friend's house, it's when I'm out and about in the world mm -hmm. <clears throat> that I need him to work. And that he does have, A, he does have downtime. Mm -hmm. And you're right, nine days out of 10, he has more downtime than work time. Yeah. Um, and even in my work situation, I'm in an office eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. He's not, he's, he's on duty mm -hmm. because I may need him to get up and help a client, go to the restroom, go yeah. get lunch, yeah. but he's not actively guiding me. And that is almost sometimes harder for these guys because it's sort of like being on call at the fire station. Mm -hmm. You can't go off and, you know, carouse and, and be crazy because you have to be ready for a fire. So you're at a, at a heightened state of readiness. Some of our um, dogs are uh, just as good at napping as yes, they are. That's right. <laughs> at some, of the, some of them are. This one is a star at napping. Um, so I just, it's so complex, and I love that you were able to come and talk about it because I think that it's, I mean, I have a hard time wrapping my head around it, and, mm -hmm. and I've been working guide dogs for 30 years. So mm -hmm. when you think about someone who just sees us walking down the street and um, has to realize, you know, re may not realize that all of what went, all of what went into getting that dog next to me on that mm -hmm. street. And mm -hmm. I just, it, it's really, really cool. Um, so even though I don't live in a state or town that has rapid transit, I know that any dog that's trained, even though the dog is carefully picked to be matched with me, I could conceivably mm -hmm. and, and, and actually do travel all about doing different things. Mm -hmm. So the dog is gonna be exposed to all ranges of environments. Am I correct about that? Um, yeah. So. Public transportation is definitely something that we work on in training as well. Um, and in terms of the travel part of it, that's really where our puppy raisers um, end up shining because they will usually take them on a lot of buses, a lot of different trains, um, through the airport, things like that. So because we have our campuses are based in one area, our dogs are going to get exposure to the areas that are surrounding our campus and the kennel where they end up living. But within that area, we're exposing them to all sorts of, as many environments as we can get our hands on. Mm -hmm. um, and that will definitely include, yes, like public transportation, like you said. Probably the only thing that we don't necessarily get to do is airplanes. Right. So we really rely on our puppy raisers yep. for that. Um, that exposure since we can't get ourselves to the airport and <laughs> go on flights all the time. <laughs> Except when we go on follow up, like when I flew Right, <laughs> but you don't get to have a dog when you're on follow up. <laughs> yeah. And that, I'm glad you brought follow up. The reason you, you, although I do believe that the reason you came here was just to be on this show, I also recognize <laughs> that while you were here, you, they decided to give you a follow up trip. And follow up <laughs> is, for me, one of the primary, or no, I shouldn't say one of the primaries, there's so many reasons that I picked this particular program mm -hmm. to receive my dog, but one of them is the follow up in that. It's not just this amazing lead up and then class where I get trained with my dog and then, okay, 
come on back when you need a new dog because mm -hmm. we'll see you in 10 years or you know, 30 years. I'm, I'm determined this one's going to work for 30. <laughs> um, every year I have the option of having a, an in-person or telephone follow-up meeting mm -hmm. so that guide dogs for the blind, even though they're based way out there on the West Coast, can get eyes on us, can, not because they don't believe we're doing a good job, not because they're checking up on us, but because, A, I want a chance to brag on my dog and say, isn't he just the best dog ever? I don't care how many graduates you see while you're here. This is, mine is the best. Uh, and we will all say that, by the way. Everyone believes that. No, I agree. Yours is um, the best dog. There you go. Good answer. Um, but also, if there is something that I'm struggling with, it's not in a critical situation, but if there's something I'm struggling with, I know that I will have an instructor here that I can focus on that in my own home environment. Mm -hmm. One of the other things about um, sort of a part and parcel with follow-up is that there's emergent care. So let's say it's not my annual follow-up time and I have, we have some sort of event that happens that causes a crisis for our work together as a, as a guide dog team. It could be a dog attack. It could be the fact that I walked to work. Let, let's say I was a person who walked to work every day by a skateboard park and one day we got hit by a person on a skateboard. Mm -hmm. And now my dog says, no way, that is not a safe place. I'm not taking you there anymore. So if we can't solve that problem over the phone with the graduate services department, Guide Dogs has a commitment to have an instructor on the ground in your home environment as soon as it is possible or necessary, depending on the level of the emergency that you're having. And that is such a sense of, and that doesn't matter if I live in Connecticut or California or Canada, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that you get as a graduate. And it's so fabulous to know that it's there. Mm -hmm. So. And for you, it's cool because not only are you training dogs and going to class mm -hmm. and teaching dogs and then getting string and training and teaching, yeah. but you get this other piece, which is to see dogs in the field. And I suspect, um, and I might have heard from other instructors possibly, <laughs> that when you see a graduate and a dog in, this, in the field, that it's not the textbook stuff that happens in class. When we get our dogs in class, it's like they're just crisp and new and everything is exact. And then you get your dog in the field and you're working for a while and they're still a safe, but you're not saying left anymore. You're kind of like, hang a Louie, <laughs> bang a right. You know, you got your own words. And, and, it's, and, and sometimes I know I'm like, oh my God, my instructor is going to realize that when I, I say these crazy things to my dogs, he understands them and he does them. So that must be kind of interesting to see dogs working in, in environments different than you train in and actually on sort of boots on the ground mm -hmm. doing their job. Yeah, I love the follow-up part of our, of my job and... You know, guide dogs for the blind, that is something that sets them apart. Many schools produce wonderful guide dogs and provide wonderful training for their clients. Um, we just, we also dedicate ourselves to providing them services in the field as well. Really? Um, so I get to actually watch what really happens when they're customized. That's what we like to <laughs> there say. There you go. That's it. I customized my dog. <laughs> and then I can take that back and it always influences my own training of the guide dogs that I train too. I say, oh, this person has this in this environment. I'm going to try and seek that out um, in the Portland area. So it's, it's really informative, educational, and super rewarding to see our guides working in the field. Awesome. Well, I can't believe we're out of time. This show just isn't long enough. <laughs> it never is. Enough. It never is. Um, I want to thank everyone for tuning in to As I See It, A Blind Woman's View. I want to thank Jamie for being here today and for coming all the way from Oregon to, mm -hmm. to be on my show. <laughs> you are part, this is part of the series Pup and partner, excuse me, pup and person to partners. Too many P's, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> and I hope that you all have a great month and tune in next month when we follow this series further. Thanks so much. Have a great day.